I, I left it off for now, but. Yeah, I promise I won't say anything. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to our second public forum for the parking study here in Nashua. Um, quickly, I just wanted to introduce the folks that are up here with us tonight. Um, I have some of my staff from the parking department. Uh, to my right, um, I have Samantha Allen. She is our, our maintenance member of the team. Um, far to the left, we have one of our parking enforcement specialists and also an intern that's uh, in our department now. Um, and then in the middle, we have Andy Hill with Desmond Associates. He's the consultant for this project. And then to his right, in my immediate left, we have Alderman O'Brien, who has been a member of the steering committee for this project. So first, I just wanted to take a minute to thank everyone for, for being a part of this and also thank the public for all of the input that they've provided so far. Um, it's a very comprehensive study, but I think it's well worth it, and there's going to be a lot of good information to come out of it. Um, we're probably a little bit more than halfway through the project at this point. We're, we're at about the two-third mark. Two-third mark. So, um, and we do have another survey that will be coming out uh, early next week, but I'll let Andy speak to that a little bit more. But I just wanted to take a minute to um, thank all of my staff and all of the steering committee members. Um, the stakeholders that we've met with, and then, of course, all the members of the public, because um, that's why we're here. We want your input. So thank you very much. I'll turn this over to Andy. Thank you. Um, we have a uh, very full agenda this evening here, and I tried to break it up into five component parts. We've been working here in Nashua since September of last year, um, gathering information, talking to folks, uh, studying the issues and starting to develop uh, some ideas on how we might go about addressing some of the challenges um, that we've identified over over this period here and tonight is really our opportunity to come out and present to you um, some of those options and start to get some feedback on what is uh, going to work in Nashua here um, I have been doing this for a little over 22 years, and uh, you, you can make a living doing this. Um, and I know parking very well. I do not profess to be an expert in Nashua. So part of the feedback that we're hoping to get this evening is um, we're basing our recommendations on our observations, on our experience, on best practices. But we need the experts in Nashua to tell us what's actually going to work or play in Nashua. Uh, and that will help us refine uh, our planning and refine our recommendations. So the feedback that we get uh, tonight and through the survey that's going to be available afterwards really is going to help shape that final report that goes before the Board of Aldermen for consideration. So in terms of just progress this evening, really, like I said, we've got a five-point presentation. We're going to start with uh, what we heard so we can review for you uh, all of the different perspectives that were presented to us on parking, um, including a, a dissection of the results that we got from the survey that we conducted last October, which had uh, over a thousand respondents to it. So. quite a bit of time exploring the concepts and strategies. At the end, we'll have uh, some time for you to take the mic and give us some feedback and some comments and some direction. Now, the good news is this is not going to be uh, two hours of me talking directly at you and you trying to absorb all of this. We've actually tried to uh, stage this so that as we go through various themes or chunks of information. We'll give you initial presentation. We'll have a question and answer period afterwards to clarify um, anything that you've seen, answer any questions you might have with regards to what we presented thus far, and then move on to the next section. 
Um, because we have a very full agenda this evening, I will ask during the Q&A period, um, if we can, to just try and keep the questions to clarifying what's been presented. I don't want to get uh, too far afield um, because I don't want to keep you here all night, especially on a beautiful evening like this. So that being said, let's start with what we heard. Um, and we've had the opportunity to do a lot of listening here since the inception of this project. We have been, I'm sorry, what? Oh, is it not showing up on Zoom right now? We'll pause for a moment. There'll be a copy of this available online yeah. uh, to go with the survey so that folks can go and review this. I believe this is being recorded and I believe right. we'll also have the opportunity to post this as a recording. So um, those are both kind of key pieces of the survey piece because we want folks to be able to hear what was said here to actually see the presentation for themselves so that we can then capture their reactions to some of the different ideas and concepts. Did everybody hear that? No. Out there, okay. Andy okay. and I were talking. Andy, go ahead. Right so, yeah, yeah. let me start again from scratch. Um, the process that we've designed uh, is, is really, um, it's critical that folks have an ability to actually view the PowerPoint for themselves. Uh, this meeting is also being recorded, so folks will have a chance to go back and listen to what was said um, to get clarification that way as well. Both of those will be posted on um, links through the city's parking department website and then uh, we will also be posting a link through that website to the survey as well so that there's an opportunity um, for folks to see what was see and hear what was said see the presentation itself and then um, react to that within the survey tool There we go. Yeah. Very temperamental mouse. Yeah. And we'll confirm that we are like a pro. Live and feeding. Okay. So. Um, getting back to, to what we heard, um, we have had the opportunity uh, for the last seven months to work with a steering committee made up of city staff, local citizens, and representatives of the planning organizations that serve this area. Uh, that's a list of the members up there on the screen. Several of them are here at the table with me. And we've had a series of meetings where we've come together to discuss the scope of work, some initial impressions as we've been gathering data and going out and meeting uh, with the public here. Um, early deliverables as we started to compile information. And they've been our sounding board um, and helped us vet through this to get to this point this evening. Uh, we've had a fairly extensive series of stakeholder meetings. Uh, which have included uh, all of the organizations that you see up on the screen here. In addition to the meetings that you see here on the screen that were specific to this project, um, I have also been working and I was working in Nashua um, for most of 2021 on a separate project involving overnight parking. Andy, can we just, just pause for one second? We're still having an issue with the screen thing. Yeah. We seem to have dueling presentation. Okay. <clears throat> so 
the issue, Andy, it's not changing s slides like it was doing the other day in our, our steering meeting. Oh, good. So I think we need to just, can you hit escape on that keyboard? I can. We have to go through it. We'll just go through it a slide at a time. We can do it that way. Yeah. That way we can see it. Okay. All right. Are we getting a decent feed now? So right now you're, you are seeing your screen. Okay, if we can minimize the screen at the corner so that the folks at home can actually see. Yeah, you can. Can you clear the border? Mm -hmm. No, we can't. That's the problem. Oh, you can't. When we go into the slide slideshow mode, it's not changing screens for some reason. Sure no, can we minimize the screen, um, the black screen that shows? The yeah, we can minimize that. So it's, this is on his screen now, so. Yeah, because it's not on my Okay, yeah, the other five, we should be able to. Okay. That good? All right, that'll work. I'm gonna bring it down towards the bottom. Oh, let's uh, improve on it. Here we go, okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. <laughs> All right, take three. So. Um, like I said, we, we did a significant amount of going out to various stakeholder groups that were identified uh, to us through the city uh, to talk about this engagement as a whole. Um, we had had some involvement uh, with some of these groups prior to this in working through the overnight parking study that was completed and is in front of the Board of Aldermen uh, at this time here. Um, we have also had the opportunity to collaborate on uh, the ongoing NIMCO project uh, that's going on in the mill yard and sit in on the recent presentation on uh, potential for the Elm Street School. You are seeing us. Okay. okay. So, moving on, um, some of the key takeaways that we had from those meetings, um, it, across all boards and all groups, there was a significant concern about safety, specifically safety within the public parking facilities, safety on the public streets, the ability for folks to move around and feel secure and comfortable. Um, we heard from multiple property owners that it is a challenge right now to try and lease properties uh, in downtown Nashville because they can't secure enough parking uh, in order to execute those leases and they're competing with uh, suburban locations that can offer much more generous uh, parking ratio uh, on their lease terms. A lot of folks had raised uh, concerns about the impact of the school street project, the Performing Arts Center and also the outdoor dining program. Um, and it was very clear to us from the get-go that any solutions that we came up with had to preserve uh, the existing culture um, and yet also from the number of reports that we read, uh, plans that had already been endorsed by the city and different folks that we talked to, there was also a desire to move towards sustainability. Um, was what can you do to solve overnight parking? Uh, the other one was what can you do to help the uh, address what you come up with as far as the uh, as you go along. As I mentioned, uh, we launched a survey effort with the first public forum back in October here. Uh, we had a, over a thousand respondents here. In terms of the demographics of the respondents, uh, they were fairly representative for what you would hope to see across the spectrum of the folks that live here in Nashua. Um, there were a significant, 60% uh, were identified, uh, identified themselves as female, 34% as male, uh, about 6% just decided they'd rather not say. 
Uh, the wheel that you see in the corner shows the age distribution, so every demographic was reasonably well represented. 92% um, of the folks here identified themselves as primarily driving to get in and out of downtown, which was consistent with the statistics that we've seen via U.S. Census. Uh, about 66% came downtown at least once a week, so they were informing us from a, um, a fairly frequent perspective here as far as conditions. Um, we had very good representation from all the wards in Nashua as well as the surrounding uh, towns here. So good mix of both local perspective and folks who are coming from abutting communities in to dine, play, and work. Um, and we had asked the folks to sort of identify themselves both by um, all the different reasons that they came into town as well as the primary reason. The listing across the bottom shows the folks um, identifying themselves on a primary basis, 13% uh, as employees, 13% as residents, and uh, the rest as um, patronizing a business downtown. Uh, we also allowed folks to identify themselves according to um, both primary and um, general reasons for visiting downtown. Primary is in the orange, general is in the blue, as you can see. Um, dining and visiting the business and shopping uh, and special events were all strong secondary pulls uh, coming into downtown here. In terms of general takeaways, I'm not going to take you through question by question. There were 42 of them. We could be here all night. But as far as major takeaways go, um, and we'll label this under quote unquote good news, 76% uh, of the residents said that they actually had uh, their parking needs partially or completely satisfied where they lived, and 62% of them are uh, reported to be parking for free. 61% uh, of the employees stated that they had had parking already provided by their employer, and 65% said it was happening at no cost to themselves. Um, 72% indicated that when they came down a park, they were typically staying two hours or less, which certainly aligns with a number of the time limits for the on-street parking in the area and shows a good turnover. 41% indicated they could find parking within five minutes or less. A total of 83% said they can find it within 10 minutes or less, uh, which, is, um, which is a good statistic as far as being able to locate where you need to be and get about your business. Three out of four respondents when they were asked if you couldn't find parking right in front of your destination, what would you do? Uh, indicated that they would just um, circle around and, and find a place either on the same block or within one to two blocks of their destination, but they would make every attempt to persist uh, so that they could complete their journey into downtown. Um, no surprise, the two biggest things folks look for when they were choosing a parking space were proximity and a sense of security. Um, and uh, when we ask folks, when you look at the walking path between parking and your destination, what's really important to you? Uh, number one was a personal sense of safety or security, and number two was the condition of the sidewalks uh, going between those two paths. Yeah. One of the questions that, did you do that? Advance the slide? I, I hope didn't. so. No, you did not? Okay. I did not. Oh. I flipped a paper on Mrs. Magic. Okay. So. That was great. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that we ask every community when we go in is a two-part question. We usually separate it uh, by several other intervening questions uh, on the survey because we're, we're tricky like that. But what we really ask folks are two questions. One, what's your expectation for how close is reasonably close to park to your destination? That would be all the yellow bars that you see there. Uh, the second question is later on, how far away do you typically park from your destination? So one is expectation, and one is actual practice or experience. Uh, actual practice or experience are the blue bars that you see up on the screen. And ideally what you want to see, especially um, on the closer end, is uh, the blue bars extending up over the yellow bars. That means that people's experience is actually exceeding their expectation here. 
it, it, you get into trouble, especially uh, at shorter distance when the expectation is much higher than the actual experiences. So the good news is, for the most part, folks seem to be finding parking um, well in line with their expectations here in Nashville. Now, we do have some areas um, where we had responses that raised um, items for consideration as we move forward, things that were potentially red flags. Uh, and some of these I will reveal later on why they might be red flags. Um, but of all our respondents, only 15% indicated they typically parked in a private facility. And in a few minutes, I'll explain why that statistic may be a little bit problematic and indicate a potential issue. Um, remember how we said one in four, uh, three in four folks would persist and find parking within their destination to carry out their business? Well, unfortunately, one in five indicated if they couldn't find parking in a reasonable distance and a reasonable amount of time, they would leave and go elsewhere. Um, so that's a potential issue uh, that we need to address here. Um, when we asked folks to evaluate the public parking facilities here in the city on multiple criteria, um, when we came back, uh, the answer that came back to us were the areas that were most in need of work were the general atmosphere, safety, security, and lighting. With general atmosphere, what we're typically talking about is um, olfactory, um, visual indications of um, disorder or chaos here, anything that would make somebody feel uncomfortable coming into that area, independent of lighting, um, but certainly uh, shoulder to shoulder with issues about safety and security. 70% of the folks, when asked on a five-star basis to rate the wayfinding here in town from five being absolutely fantastic to one being failing, um, of all our respondents, 70% indicated that they found the wayfinding to be passable to very poor. Now, I do need to footnote this a little bit because there were about 200 comments associated with this question, and about 100 of them stated, I've lived here all my life, I don't really notice the signage, so I rated it as a C for average. But it does su suggest to us, based on uh, the other 100 comments, that there is some work wayfinding uh, to make sure that folks feel like they can get to where they need to go. Um, and then the other issue, and this is universal across the country, when asked if you were planning on purchasing an electric vehicle, specifically one that might need charging in the future, 13% indicated that they absolutely had plans to do this in the next five years, and another 19% said they weren't sure. The reason we ask this question is it is one of the fastest growing sectors in automotive sales right now. As we sit here today, there are one public charging station for every 28 charge, charging electrical vehicles out on the road right now. And at the pace that sales are going, that gap is going to get broader and broader. So one of the solutions we want to look at is a way to get more of those charging stations out there to support this uh, so that we can support this sustainability initiative as it moves forward. So with that all said, uh, the last thing I wanted to share with you is there were um, almost 3,000 comments that were made uh, at various points throughout the survey, specifically on the last two questions, which were open-ended questions asking folks, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing parking in Nashua today? And is there anything else that you want us to be aware of? We went through and combed through uh, all of those comments here and distilled them down to their core elements and then ran them through um, a program which basically takes uh, those key phrases and blows them up according to frequency of, um, frequency of use. So dead center in the middle of that in bright red letters is availability that was the number one concern that was communicated to us across those 2,800 uh, and some odd responses here, uh, followed by overnight parking, 
security was a concern, sidewalks, uh, a little bit lower down on the list, communications enforcement zoning, uh, maintenance, turnover, you get the picture. But if you were to poll 20, uh, 2,800 and some odd Nashuans here and ask them uh, to put one word on the piece of paper and then put that together as amalgamation, that's what it would look like. So this is a guidepost to us as well as we're moving forward to make us aware of what's on the mind of uh, the typical constituents here. So with that said, we've reached our first island here. Um, does anybody have any questions about the presentation that we've had so far where we talk about what we heard? Anything I can clarify for anybody? Yes, sir. So I've heard a lot of national standards. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. If you... This is being take folks, sorry, so sorry. Yep. I'm not good to have it a record. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Vincent Davis. Um, I'm here representing the River Casino and sports bar here in Nashua. So I've heard about a lot about national averages, um, which is fantastic. Um, I actually come from huge cities and things like that. Um, being here in New Hampshire for the past six years, national, national averages are great, um, but I'm, it, it doesn't seem to speak to what's going on here in Nashua or New Hampshire as a whole. It just seems to speak like the country's moving forward, et cetera. So that seems to speak true to larger cities in more metropolitan areas. Um, and it seems like this is just a little bit of um, uh, pushing those agendas onto a, a smaller area that it, it doesn't seem to really call for what you're saying or what the, the state or cities are asking for. Um, what's, what's the question? <laughs> question is, okay. we're hearing a lot of national averages, yes, which is great. And those are great towards metropolitan areas. Um, how, how do those speak to Nashua? Can you, can you give me some specific? Um, Nashua statistic, or national statistics seem to speak towards um, availability. Um, as, as a person who operates a business here in Nashua, my number one here is security. Okay. So it doesn't seem to coincide with what I'm hearing from my patrons. Um, well, everything I just presented here was specific to Nashua and came from Nashua respondents. Okay. None of this was a nationalized statistic. So when I tell you availability was the number one issue, that was the number one issue as communicated to us from the survey that was administered specifically to Nashua constituents. Security was number two as far as the recurring concerns as far as that goes. All right, cool. I resend my time at the moment. Thank you. But I do appreciate the point, and that's one of the reasons that we're here tonight, is so that we can, especially when we get into the concept phase, we can talk about best practices, we can talk about uh, trending, but we also want to be able to get the perspective on, on what really works here in Nashua. Um, to your point, uh, the 28 to 1 is our national ratio of chargers to electric vehicles. I have to confess, I have not done enough research to be able to tell you what that ratio is in in New Hampshire or Nashua at this point in time. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Hello. Just well, I would need them to unmute. Go ahead, Roger. Um, yeah, you talk about on this study, was this study with the barriers being up or the barriers being down? Because there's going to be a difference in parking and all that. You know, that's where you talk about the survey, but like I said, is it with the barriers being in place and making, you know, one lane each way, or is it just with the barriers down? 
Uh, we studied conditions, as you'll see in the next section, under both, both set of scenarios, sir, with the barriers up and the barriers down. Uh, when the survey was being conducted, the barriers were still up at that time. Okay. Thank you. Any, any more questions before we move on? Not seeing anyone Good. So in terms of what we saw, uh, before we ever started doing work here in Nashua, we actually spent quite a bit of time studying Nashua through the prior studies and reports that have been done. I'm not going to read all of those off to you here. You can see them up on the screen. It is a significant uh, amount of work that's already been done that we've been allowed to um, build on top of. I will tell you that within every one of those plans and every one of those studies that you see up on the screen, two things were recurrent as far as themes and concerns throughout all of those studies. One was parking. And the other one was mobility, which is uh, a fancy way of saying alternative transportation or ways of getting around other than a single occupant vehicle. So this is a continuing trend uh, within the city here. We had a lot of good guidance from this that helped us build uh, our recommendations as we move forward. The area that we were working with uh, was significant. Um, the area of study that we were given uh, covers 108 total blocks, six different neighborhoods across the area here. Um, you can see that up on your screen. In this, these areas were divided up uh, to aid with data collection and also uh, along general neighborhood themes. Um, in terms of supply, uh, the magic number is without any impediments, uh, which would include barriers, uh, spaces that were lost to construction, et cetera. Uh, when we went out into uh, the field to do our inventory in September, there were a total of 13,309 potential spaces. Now, um, there were not that many functioning spaces at the time. At the time, uh, there were 13,216 spaces. Significant number of those had been lost to the outdoor dining program. Some of them had been displaced because of the ongoing construction that's going on at the Performing Arts Center here. Um, as of February, when we went back out of the field again to do another set of counts, the adjusted supply was actually 13,120. And the reason that it had gone down instead of up relative to October is while the barriers were down, at that point we had lost the school street lot. Uh, all the parking around the Myrtle Street apartments was gone as well. Uh, and there was still displacement due to construction here. So uh, as we talk about utilization, uh, know that we're benchmarking against those statistics here. Um, the other thing I want to draw folks' attention to besides the sheer number of parking spaces is the fact that 71% of them are located in private off-street facilities. Remember that statistic I circled the several, ta uh, several things back that said 15% uh, of folks indicated that they were going to park in private parking facilities when they came to town? Well, 71% of your supply is held in private Andy, parking hang facilities. Hang on one second. We're having, uh, Never asked anybody. I've never had anybody ask me to be louder. So, uh, just going back to that point here, fifteen percent of the folks within the survey indicated that they primarily use private parking when they came in town, but the majority of supply was within the private parking facilities. So that's where we have a little bit of dis disconnect here. Understanding that this was a survey sample, not necessarily every person in Nashville who's polled, but uh, some of the other observations that we had suggested that this was um, a consistent condition. So in terms of uh, on-street parking here, 
Um, this is only about 14% of the total supply. Uh, you had 218 block faces that had parking on them across the study area here. Um, one thing to note for folks here is just because you see vehicles parked there doesn't mean it's actually available, valid parking space. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking with the Department of Public Works uh, about what acceptable uh, dimensions would be if you're going to have parking along a street. Uh, as you can see up on the screen here, typically you need seven to eight feet of width um, and 20 feet of length to make a parallel parking space. And that has to be abutted by a drive aisle of at least 10 to 11 feet wide. So basically you need 18 feet of width on a roadway in order to have one-way flow and parking along one side of it here. We noted lots of locations across the city where parking was occurring without necessarily having those adequate dimensions. Um, that is more of a uh, enforcement issue than it is a dimensional issue as far as that goes. But uh, I had a lot of people ask when we were out in the field whether we were counting those spaces in front of their house. And after we got the chalk out and measured, we had to admit to them that we were not going to be able to do that. Um, one thing that you may take away from this, it's a little bit of a surprise here, of the various kinds of on-street parking in the study area here, the largest supply was in unregulated or unrestricted parking spaces, 32% of it, had no time limits on it, had no meters on it. I know when we're here downtown, we see the meters and we assume that that's sort of the standard here, but that's actually a, uh, a fairly, a relatively smaller percentage of the total supply that is on street downtown. Uh, I'm gonna put Jill on a, the spot for just a minute because the other thing I wanted to highlight was we have around 367 spaces that were marked for overnight parking permit use. And we have how many permits out for issue right now? About 200. 200, okay. So we have a reasonable balance right now between the two of those. In terms of off-street parking, um, public supply is only about 15% of the total supply. The areas that you see in uh, green and yellow up there on the screen are public lots and garages. So it's dead. Well, look, you, you, you tend to vacillate. Oh. And when you, when you look at the screen, your voice goes that way. Okay. So you, you can see the division as far as public supply goes uh, up on the screen here. Um, it's about 2,000 total parking spaces. The vast majority of them are in lots. Uh, just for reference, when we talk about public, we're talking about publicly accessible and owned by a public agency. In terms of private supply, 71% uh, of the total supply is held in private ownership and uh, restricted to exclusive use. It's about 240 surface lots. Largest concentrations are in the uh, French Hill and Southern New Hampshire Medical Center area here. Um, and 31% of that total supply is held by one of two private entities here in the city of Nashua. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be bear consideration as we move forward. Now in terms of occupancy, we did uh, a series of four initial counts in October, um, two on a Friday, one at midday and one in the evening, uh, and then on the following Saturday, one in the midday and one in the evening. Um, we can parse the numbers of that um, ad nauseum. Tonight I just want to give you sort of the top of the waves takeaway on uh, what we saw and what we drew in terms of conclusions from that. The barriers were up at this time. Um, in terms of utilization, you can see up there, um, in terms of aggregate utilization across the area, we never got up over the 50% mark here. Uh, now, 
that's not the only perspective. Uh, we also looked at it on a block by block basis. Those are the heat maps that you see on the screen to the right. This was Friday morning. This one was uh, Friday evening on the right hand side. And um, when we examined the data, we examined it uh, from the granular level all the way up. So uh, how occupied each space was, how occupied each block face was, each facility by type, private versus public, uh, all the way up to block by block as a whole in an aggregate, and then across zones as a whole in an aggregate. And what we're really looking for were issues. We're looking for shortages, and specifically what we were looking for were clusters of shortages because that is where we suspect we're going to see the biggest issues, both under current conditions and if there's growth going on that are in the future and future conditions as well. So just top of the waves on the right-hand side is uh, Saturday morning in the aggregate, showing the heating map by, by block by block. Uh, on the left-hand side are some of the uh, areas of concern that we took away. Um, we did see a number of blocks where we had vehicles parked over the stri stripe capacity in addition to blocks where there was no stripe capacity. Uh, we also saw a number of blocks where uh, the utilization rate was between 85 and 100%. For on-street parking, 85% utilization is sort of a magic number because that is the level at which if you're driving along a block face and you're looking for that last empty space, um, it is going to appear full even though there may be one available space there. So once we start seeing that level of utilization, that again is a flag to us that uh, we need to look at what's happening on this block face, on the abutting block faces, and across the block as a whole to see if this is something that's just happening right here or if this is something that's happening on a broader perspective. Um, in terms of off street, we did find one public facility that was at capacity and one private facility that was at capacity. Uh, there were a handful of private facilities on that Friday afternoon that were running up around 90%. Again, 90% is sort of that magical threshold where even though there are few available spaces, it is perceptively full. The good news is, as we started to look at each one of these conditions in and of itself, what we didn't find were uh, four full block faces on a block that had no public parking and nowhere for somebody to go on the adjacent block. There were clusters, most assuredly, but for example, going up and down Main Street um, on that Friday here, there was a high level of utilization on several blocks right in a row, but if you went half a block into the block or in down one of the side streets, you could find available spaces there, you could find available spaces in some of the public facilities that were off uh, the street as well. So while we did want to note those conditions because they certainly influence how people perceive parking availability, we also wanted to double check and see if this was a perceptive issue or if this was an actual shortage. Um, and uh, long story short is while we found a lot of clusters where there was shortfalls, we did not necessarily find anything where we looked at one, two, or three contiguous blocks and said, yeah, there's no parking available there. And this illustrates uh, the conditions that we saw on that Saturday evening. Um, one of the things I wanted to know about those Saturday observations is the duck derby was going on at that time. So um, we were aware that the conditions we're seeing may have been elevated or different from norm. Uh, so we did actually go out in the field and do additional observations. We were, of course, uh, as most folks were who were working in parking in the downtown, very aware of the outdoor dining program and the impacts that that had had on capacity and availability. Um, as a result, one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to compare what we saw 
in the fall versus what we saw uh, when the barriers were down. The best day we could find once the barriers came down to go out and take a look at that was the Friday going into Valentine's Day weekend. Uh, that's typically a big shopping and dining out day. So we felt that the level of activity there would be elevated. It would be a good benchmark to measure. Uh, when we were out in October and the barriers were in place up and down Main Street, there were a total of 57 available spaces. Uh, on the Friday afternoon, we were slightly below that number. On the Friday evening that we were out there, we were actually slightly above that number. So there are a number of vehicles that were parking illegally up and down there. When we went back out on the Friday evening going into the Valentine's Day weekend, the expanded supply was 136 spaces. We got pretty close to being at capacity. At 7 o'clock at night, we were within 16 spaces of being full but there were available spaces at either end of Main Street to accommodate those, so we were a little bit below that. In addition, as we did observations going into the side streets and into the public lots and garages that were just off Main Street, there was available capacity there as well. Uh, similarly, when we went back out to the mill yard here, uh, we had done our counts on Duck Derby Saturday, so we went back out on the Saturday preceding um, the, uh, the Valentine's Day holiday here and did some additional counts. Uh, the barriers were down at that time. We had lost School Street. We had also lost the parking around uh, the Myrtle Street apartment complex. So all of those had impacted the supply. Um, what we found was that on-street oc occupancy was actually up substantially from what we had seen um, in the fall, despite which was interesting because we had less supply in the fall, but lower levels of utilization and uh, more supply in the spring, but higher levels of utilization. Uh, there was also higher levels of utilization in the day on the public off-street facilities. In the evening, it was actually down about 5%. So what that suggested to us is with the additional capacity was available on street, folks were migrating from some of those off-street facilities they had used in the fall to some of the on-street facilities that were available in the spring. And then there were moderate increases in uh, the private facilities in terms of utilization. One of the other things that we did on that Friday going into the Valentine's Day weekend uh, is we did what was called a license plate inventory. And we went uh, up and down the length of Main Street and in on a number of the uh, adjacent cross streets. And we recorded the license plate of every vehicle that was parked in every space from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, and we did this not necessarily because we're nosy and we're into invasion of privacy, but because by analyzing that data, it could tell us what typical length of stay was, how often the spaces turned over, that is how many cars came through a typical space during the day, and how many of those folks were compliant with the posted time limits. Uh, the other thing that it told us were how many folks, uh, how, what percentage of those users were actually coming out and shuffling their cars. Uh, for those of you who have never seen or engaged in this practice, it is the common practice of moving the car periodically here so that you don't draw a ticket for staying too long in a particular time zone. Um, so turnover was not bad. Uh, the spaces turned over about 3.3 times across this entire area during the course of the day, which is a fairly good volume as far as it goes. Um, but 22% of the vehicles that we surveyed during the course of this 12-hour period were staying over the posted time limits, and 5%, an additional 5% were playing the shuffle game. So what that suggests to us is uh, there are some parking enforcement issues here that need to be addressed in order to make sure that there's compliance, especially in those curbside spaces that are so important to the businesses up and down Main Street. And this gives you just a little bit more detail on that data that we collected there. So in terms of observations, just to sort of summarize, I know this was a lot, and thank you for bearing with me through this. Um, 
Availability is a concern. It's certainly a concern on a block face by block face or block by block basis. On a slightly larger macro basis here, there is availability within the area. It doesn't change the perception of availability. Um, but there is availability within the area. Uh, again, a lot of unused supply out there that if we could find a way to unlock that could be used to address a lot of different issues. Um, high level of, of uh, overtime parking and shuffling across the area. Um, and from what we could perceive just from our own observations and our own tour, uh, a lot of the security concerns um, that had been communicated to us seem to be tied to, uh, in addition to lighting uh, and, and general, the ability to generally secure facilities, just a lack of presence in those facilities itself and uh, lack of activity on the side streets off of Main Street here that made those areas feel very unsafe. In addition to all of this work, uh, we also uh, have been engaged on an ongoing operational assessment, uh, looking at how parking is run in the city of Nashville here. Uh, this is a general overview of all of the different things that we've touched upon, and we're going to touch upon some of them this evening as we go along here. Um, Part of that operation review was really looking at Nashua relative to other comparable communities. We came up with a list of comparable communities and vetted it through the steering committee. Some of these committees, communities are um, very comparable to Nashua. Some of them are common sense. We wanted to look at how they were doing parking in Concord and Manchester and Portsmouth and Lowell. Those are all very close to us. Um, we also wanted to look at similar communities that did parking very well, but weren't necessarily geographically super close. So uh, Missoula, Montana, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is roughly about the same size as Nashville. They have a lot of the same challenges. They have a river bisecting through the middle of downtown. Um, and we thought that they were a reasonable comparable. Some other ones are more aspirational. Albany. Uh, Ann Arbor, New York, or and Albany, New York, Ann Arbor, Michigan are both well known for having a very uh, good parking program as, West, as is West Hartford, Connecticut. So when we benchmarked against these things or compared how we're doing things in Nashville relative to them, uh, we were looking at those as more of aspirational communities. And just some initial takeaways uh, from our preliminary operational findings. Um, most of those other communities had parking systems that were roughly the same size and scope as Nashua is, some a little bit bigger, some a little bit smaller. What we noticed was in terms of staffing uh, to service or manage those, uh, Nashua was very much at the lower end of scale of things here. The department that's running parking right now is very lean in terms of staffing here. Um, and as you will see as we go along, um, we believe that it's understaffed, both from a comparative standpoint, but also from an actual functional standpoint as well, which is why we're having some of the issues that we noted with enforcement, uh, among other things here. Um, policies and SOPs uh, were actually very good. Um, most of them we found to be very clear and very appropriate for the community. Uh, maintenance practices are good, although there are a number of things that could be subcontracted out to other parties. Uh, certainly, we think ticket adjudication is something the city should look at outsourcing to a third party here to free up staff to do other things. Uh, with the amount of uh, citation processing and permit processing that has to happen in the city, uh, you really need a dedicated clerk to do that. It's being done in sort of a part-time and ad hoc basis. Um, your single head meters across the city are reaching the end of their service life and there may be an opportunity as you look at replacing them and being able to introduce uh, technology that offers a lot more features than what you've got right now uh, at a very minimum, accepting debit card and credit cards for payment as well as coins. Um, snow emergencies, uh, in terms of the actual policies and procedures, um, Nashville is doing a pretty good job getting the word out that there's a snow emergency here. 
Uh, I will confess to you this is something we're still working on and we're still working on basically because we have yet to identify a reservoir. The biggest challenge that's facing Nashville right now is where to put all the cars uh, they, so that you can get them off the street so that you can do snow removal. And I, I wish I could tell you I had an answer in my back pocket on that one, but we're still working on that one. Um, the, the, the last thing that the last thing that we, uh, we, we did come back with is in looking at uh, the amount of ground that a typical um, parking officer, parking enforcement officer has to cover, one of the ways that you could potentially save money is by looking at installing access control uh, equipment in some of the Philly facilities that will support that, specifically the garages. Um, you could put gates and automated uh, fee collection systems in there, and that would cut down on the amount of ground that parking enforcement officers have to cover as far as that goes. It would potentially also increase your collections um, by making sure that everybody who goes in and uses it is actually paying. So folks, you've been very patient and done a great job in bearing with me. Before I move on to the next section, does anybody have any questions on what I presented thus far? Yes, ma'am, come on up to the mic. My name is Jesse Exilis. It looks like from the observations that you made that all of your data collection was done on a Friday or a Saturday. Is that correct? That is correct, yes, ma'am. Um, Speaking as a resident of the downtown area and living on a block that you have identified as problematic, I can truthfully say that uh, a Friday or a Saturday collection does not fully or adequately address the parking issues that we have on my block, specifically because I live on the edge of a residential and commercial district, and the parking situation is most problematic on Tuesdays between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And so that is not um, addressed in any of the observations that you have collected. What's driving it at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m.? Those are interesting times on a Tuesday. Uh, there are two businesses on my block that operate during normal business hours. And all of their patrons and all of their staff have to park during those times. Uh, Friday afternoons, they have the least amount of opening for those particular businesses. They're already closed. And on Saturdays, they don't... Um, routinely have open hours. So unfortunately, the observations that have been provided um, miss that piece of the parking situation. If you can grab me at the end of this and let me know where that is, I'm happy to go out on a Tuesday and take a look for myself. Great, I would very much appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Herbert Lewis. I'm, I'm a long time resident here in Nashville for over 50 years. And I was a downtown business owner until uh, 2017. Code enforcement had to shut us down. But I live on 100 Main Street. I call that part of Main Street the red zone. Uh, it's very busy in that area. I live uh, over top of the Mexican Grill restaurant. That's right there. Yes, sir. And you got the Enterprise Bank. And then I park. I have a, my landlord gives me a parking permit for the Pearson Street, uh, Pearson Ave mm -hmm. park lot, which is a city lot. Uh, a lot of private lots back there, too. Where I live, I have a bird's eye view of all of that. All those lots back there from the library, all those lots that are back there. And uh, there's a lot of pirates back there collecting cars in the private lots. <laughs> that costs a lot of money. But my, my problem is that you have a sign. And um, I, I, I park in the Pearson Ave lot, the second lot back, not where the meters are, but the second one back, when you're coming off of Park Ave, there's a, everyone likes to take that little throughway to beat the light. There's a sign there that says no throughway. I don't know how many times I've dodged cars trying to, because I'm trying to go home now, because I park right there in that lot where I have to park. And you're parking enforcement, so you may know you guys have your own maps, friends. Believe me, I, I call you guys and I call the police department, and I understand you guys are two different entities now. At one time, you guys were one department, but now you're separate entities. You got the parking enforcement and you have the police department. I've had, um, I'll come home from work. I, get, I work for NSKS. I get out of work at 5, 6 o'clock. Your signs say that that's free parking from 7 
through five. Weekends are free, holidays are free. So when I come home, if there's someone in my parking spot, that's okay, even though I have a permit, so therefore I have to move someplace else and park. So in that same lot, everybody's parked. Well, the business owners for Enterprise and whoever else owns businesses there, they all park on that wall on Park Street side facing north to south. On the other side of that lot, I'm in six and seven. I have to park from east to west, but there's no markings to indicate how I should park. Um, how I found that out is my landlord had me park on the front lot at first when I first moved. I've been here for, in that lot now, for, uh, Pearson F for like two years. I moved in in 2020 of November. Um, they told me to park, he told me to park in the front lot, which I did, was number five, but uh, I met a nice lady um, from, from park enforcement. She told me, oh, you're in the wrong parking spot. So I moved, she told me where to go, not knowing that I should have been parking the way I should have parked, which I do now, but I would have never known that because there's, there's no marking. So here's seven, here's six. So if someone parks on seven, which is my spot, I'll park in six, but then they, they'll have a hard time getting out and call the police on me which I have a permit, they're in my spot, they'll call the police on me and I have to move. I'm a victim down there. I've been a victim down there for a long time and when I call up parking enforcement, all I get is an answering machine. And I'll get a phone call two or three days later when I need them at that moment. Um, we don't have any towing service for our lot. But for the private lots, I see all kinds of towing going on down there all the time. Um, a lot of crime goes on down there. I had both my tires stabbed um, coming out one morning. I, I parked where my landlord told me behind a person that was in my spot. I guess they decided to move over to the other side of the lot. I come out the next morning, my tires are flat. So now, is that a parking enforcement issue or is that a police department issue now when I want to report a crime? Is, is that your question, sir? Is that a, I'm asking a question, yeah, as far as, as, far as my situation. So, yes, you can call the police department. Okay, so that is, a part, that is a police department issue now, right? Which I tried However, to... However, you can also call our office so we can assist. So I've given up on calling. What do you mean your office? What do you mean? The parking department. The parking, the parking enforcement department, the you mean? Par the parking department, which it oversees enforcement and, and maintenance. Well, I never heard of, I never even heard of that. I thought, all I know is parking enforcement, which is down on the uh, Elm Street. Yep. That's where you guys so, are located, right? So de let's, I definitely want to connect with you at the end because I want to talk through some of those okay. issues and, and see what we can do to kind of remedy some of those concerns. Okay. Um, but absolutely if you have some sort of vandalism or something oh. like that you would want to report that and it's costing me money right my landlord's not going right to pay for it police department and so there was two officers posted up on main street that morning when i came out i found my tire stabbed i went to Duncan Donna, when i came back and said can i report a crime to you oh and i like to know my situation well that's a parking enforcement situation they said well, no, it isn't. It's a crime now because my, both my tires are flat. I want to report it to you. Oh, well, you got to. So they're, they're just passing the buck. I get to my job. I called up the chief of police. He gave me a secretary. She was not too happy with those two officers. They should have taken my report. They ended up sending a police officer to my job. That, that was, that's how I was able to get a report in. I shouldn't have had to do that. You know, but anyways, meanwhile, I can go on and on and on and on. I would like to suggest a few things, because I, I don't want to beat up the police department or the parking enforcement. I know you, everybody's on a tight budget, and they're short-handed from what I see, you know, from the surveys. Now, when you guys doing your surveys, do you do it on like, do you, do you go on holidays and check out the parking, how it is in that red zone area of where I live? Like the Irish pub, and then you got the Mexican restaurant, and you've got, you guys ever do surveys as far as parking when it comes to holidays down in that area? The parking situation? <laughs> yeah, well, you don't want to. You're going to have your hands full. It's a mess. There's a lot of crime that goes on there. I, like I said, I got bird's eye view where I live. There's a lot that goes on there. 
um, security reasons I can see why people have concerns is because you got a lot of people, the homeless, and a lot of people that are hanging out in those areas. The river's there, the library, they, they, they're all over the place, all through those lots there. I see it all the time. All right, there's I, no I, cameras. I don't want to cut you off, but we do want to make sure everybody else gets a okay. chance to speak. Yeah. But, there's no but cameras. Let's definitely connect towards the end and talk through some of those okay, issues. Okay, no cameras. We need more um, police patrol and... If you can mark the, the parking areas down there, if you can stripe it down there so we know how to park. Yep, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Alderman McLean, please come on up. Uh, thank you. Um, Jill, when you, when you mentioned about the 367 overnight parking spaces and you said there were only 200, I think people also don't quite understand the overnight parking. It's not everybody, every resident would qualify for it. It's only certain streets that qualify, and the overnight parking is only on certain streets. So for instance, if I lived on Lock Street, there, there are streets that have overnight parking, but I don't qualify because that street is not qualified, correct? Can you just kind of explain that a little bit? My yes, correct. So, so the overnight parking program, the way it is structured currently, um, is very address and street specific. So it ha to qualify, you have to live at a qualifying address. Um, that is part of the program. Um, we did have a study that was done actually by Des with Andy from Desmond mm -hmm. uh, back last year. Um, <coughs> actually, year before, year before that? 2021. Year before that. Yeah. Uh, oh, was it last year? I thought it was 2020 that we jumped right into that. I don't know. The last two years have been a little bit of a blur. Yes. Um, so there was a study that was conducted um, and a very nice report that Andy put together with some recommendations on how to potentially look at modifying that plan, adding streets, um, and making some adjustments there. Um, that is currently up on the website for folks to review, um, and I know that it would require legislation to make some changes to that, um, but as of right now, the, the way the legislation stands, it, it, is, uh, it is very address specific. Um, that's kind of the, the gist of the program, but that's why, and thank you for, for coming up and bringing that up. That is a big question a lot of folks have. They, they don't understand always why they may not qualify. Hello, uh, Vincent Davis, representing the River Sports Bar and Casino. Um, so, the our business supports any plan for improvement um, that you've brought forward what our, our issue is is that our business is down 35 to 40 percent which also affects um, nonprofits that we support and um, we're not seeing any movement in what you're proposing what we're hearing is that ah they're fine so I'm, I'm looking for a little bit more clarification on why you think that our business is okay versus people will walk from one certain entity to another. You know, we had, we had a whole parking lot taken away from us, which is fine. And, um, but again, um, we're, we're just a little bit confused on how your plan is solving a parking situation in our neck of the woods, if that makes sense. And we're going to get there, sir. Okay. Very Thank soon. You. Appreciate it. Actually, within the next 10 slides. Look forward to that. Okay. I have one more question. If anyone else? No, but there's no removal. Okay, so we're my Sir, if you can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so. So just real quick. Okay, yeah, but there's no removal. Yeah. Okay, so unless it's a city ordinance, if it's announced that, you know, it's no removal, get off the streets or get off the city lot. Well, for us, we have to get out the city lot and go to the parking garage. But if I go to the parking garage and there's no parking, what do I do? Because that happened to me one time, and there was like, I came back down to the lower level, and there were three spaces, uh, reserve spaces that were empty. So I'm like, reserve for who? So I took one. <laughs> and, but I came out the next day, I had a $15 ticket. So that's, so that's one of our challenges that we, we are aware of, and, that, and I think Andy mentioned it in one of his last slides. That is something that we need to look at, um, where we can potentially add some more capacity for during snow emergencies. So that is something that is going to be looked at. Well, 
And I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, I mean, again, the biggest issue that we're seeing right now with how the city handles a snow emergency is finding that reservoir and, and where people can go and get off of the streets. Right. And this is, this is while it's pale comfort, this is an issue that every New England town has. Uh, especially New England towns that were built in mill districts along the river. You have a very compact geographic area and you don't have a lot of fields just sitting there empty where you can store dozens or hundreds of cars for 24 to 48 hours. But we're going to work on the reservoir question here and before this is done we'll have an answer for you one way or another on that. Any questions from the internet? No. All right. So just to sort of summarize what we've taken away so far from the work that we've done in terms of issues that are challenging the city right now, uh, and, and then some key challenges that we put in front of ourselves in order to, as we're developing options here. Um, you have a lot of plans uh, that the city has that they've spent a lot of money on that talk about uh, the desire to make a more environmentally sustainable, walkable, multimodal uh, city, but you have to very much balance that against the fact that the culture right now, like most communities, is still very car-centric. Uh, and very oriented on folks being able to get in and out uh, by personal vehicle. So as we talk about transitioning that, that's one of the biggest challenges, is how do you make that transition in such a way that you don't leave anybody out in the cold uh, and you do accommodate all needs going forward. One of the significant challenges that is, is within the D1 district, zoning district, which includes downtown, there are no parking requirements on uh, new development in there. Um, and you have a number of future projects on the board, not the least of which being the riverfront project that are going to take um, parking out of circulation. And in addition, I can tell you, having done this for 20 plus years, as you continue to grow, as you continue to evolve, as folks come in, they're going to be looking at more and more of those surface lots, public and private, as potential development sites. So one of the challenges is how do we stay ahead of that? Um, across New England, there's a strong demand right now for residential. Um, there's a, apparently a significant appetite for downtown residential here. Uh, but the overnight parking program that you have in place has very limited capacity uh, and it is, um, it, it, even if we could open it up, the street widths that you have and some of the restrictions are still going to very much limit and handicap that. So one of the things we had to do is really look at some alternatives to the existing program as it stands right now. Um, because we have to maintain those right-of-ways for service and emergency vehicles. We can't just clog those streets up. Uh, enforcement is a continuing issue. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of calls in a lot of those prior studies. There were a lot of requests as we talked to members of the public within the survey itself to see more active roles played in managing the parking that's in place right now. Um, and unfortunately, those are being put on a department that's not adequately staffed at this point in time. Uh, and then we talked about this. Uh, the city only owns 30% of the public, uh, or 30% of the total parking supply, and yet um, the express preferences for public parking across the area, a lot of the comments were focused on public parking. Um, in an area that uh, has limited resources to develop more parking and in a city that has limited financial resources uh, to develop more infrastructure here. Um, safety, 
is an overriding concern and, and we have some ways of addressing that as we're moving forward here. Uh, and we want to strengthen communication uh, so that folks understand what's happening with the parking system here uh, and have uh, some better information to make decisions as we go forward. So that all being said, kind of the core challenges, and you'll hear these six themes over and over again as we go through some of the different concepts are, uh, what can we do to expand capacity in a way that's financially sustainable? Uh, how can we make that transition to a more multimodal environment uh, while still supporting the existing businesses and redevelopment? Uh, how can we manage what we've got? How can we make things feel safer and more inviting? And what can we do to address this pervasive concern about availability? So those were the six main charges that sort of uh, led to uh, the formulation of the uh, solutions that I want to walk, walk you folks through. But before we get to that, does anybody have any questions on just these key insights and, and challenges here? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I think that the public is also unaware of is where we can put parking. You talked about the limit of the width of the streets and so on, but there's also some certain parking rules that say you can't park behind um, a driveway. You can't park within so many feet of a driveway. You can't park within 25 feet of an intersection. And that also inhibits. And we have very old streets, very narrow streets. And I know my ward is Ward 3, which is French Hill. We have a horrible time in there, and I know, and I also have Franklin Street and all of that area, but then there's also the downtown area, and these are the two wards that are the most affected by it. The overnight parking study kind of helped indicate where we could possibly have some parking, and as Jill's pointed out, we have 300 plus, we're not using them all, um, and, and I know it's incumbent upon us as, as aldermen to kind of come up with some more, but I think we still need stabilization because we're still talking about changing some of the streets, like maybe flipping West Pearl on its, on its head and, and changing the direction of it and, and, you know, taking the Broad Street Parkway and going all the way to Franklin Street. All of these things, I think, is kind of stopping us from moving forward, but the public doesn't understand that. So I, I think we, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to vary from that, but it's a frustration that, that the public does have. So I think when we're talking about some of the key challenges, it's all the challenges that you said, but it's also what's coming down the pike that's stopping us from moving forward. And it just looks like we're kind of getting in the way of the, of the public being able to get some parking spaces. So I think moving forward, we need to kind of talk about some of those things. I know there's talk about changing Canal Street, certain parts of it and so on. Maybe that'll add more parking. Maybe it'll take away, I don't know. But I think those are part of the conversations that we have to have with the parking. They go hand in glove, so thanks. So let's get into it. Concepts and strategies. Organize this under eight general headings. Here, we'll be coming back to this slide over and over again so you can sort of see how we're progressing through this. But let's get into the question of how we increase public parking. And again, these are all concepts, these are all ideas. We're not married to any of these. We're floating them out to get feedback here. Um, one of the things that we looked at was we looked at the width of Main Street, um, and dimensionally, it has the ability to support a conversion from parallel to angle parking. Um, that would take uh, your capacity up and down that street um, from the river all the way down to Hollis to somewhere between, from 84 spaces up to around 150. So we wouldn't double the capacity, but we would increase it by about 40%. Um, this would meet uh, some of the goals that we outlined in terms of capacity, multi, um, support, and availability here. Um, however, there are some real downsides to this. It would mean losing two travel lanes, which would constrain traffic flow. Um, 
Concord recently did a massive uh, roadway project there, and it was 12 to 18 months and two to three million dollars, which is what we think this is probably going to run in the neighborhood. Downtown Main Street? Huh? The, the downtown Main Street in Concord? Yeah. Um, this, this would align with the vision plan for downtown. It would create traffic calming, which is one of the things that's been asked for in a lot of studies in order to enhance walkability. It would slow uh, traffic going up and down Main Street. Um, but it's got some significant challenges. The phasing is going to be very difficult to minimize disruption. And probably most critical is before any of this can go forward, uh, DPW and the traffic engineer would need to do a full review on this and an impact analysis and verify that this can actually be supported going forward. Uh, and that we're not going to divert traffic just into the side streets and shift the congestion and speed from here one block over either way. Um, sir, this is for you. Uh, you have, yes, yes sir. <laughs> you, you have uh, an existing parking structure uh, that's in good shape, but it is, it's, okay. it's structurally in good shape. This is for you, sir. All right. You, you have an existing parking structure uh, that structurally is in good shape. There was recently appraisal done of it. Um, there is a significant amount of investment that needs to go in to extend its life cycle, but it is still standing. It is still operating. However, it's fairly inefficient design. It's a very dated design as far as that goes. Uh, as it gets older, um, it's going to get more expensive to fix. Durability is going to continue to be an issue. Right next to it, you have a surface lot that would allow expansion of the footprint. Uh, if we could blow up this footprint here, we could go from 293 spaces in those two locations up to 585 over the same five-story span. So this is an ability to introduce a lot of capacity into the area, greater availability. Um, in addition, you could also make something that is far safer. Uh, new design now allows for higher floor-to-ceiling uh, clearances here, which means more light intrudes into the facility. State-of-the-art lighting systems make them brighter and more comfortable as far as it goes. Huh? Yes. So, um, state... No, but state-of-the-art lighting systems would be a thing here. Um, and there are some other features that could be added into the design to address some of the ongoing safety and security issues here. Um, it is a good location in terms of supporting infill development on that side of Main Street, uh, supporting the pack as that comes online. Um, so there are a lot of things to like about the site as far as that goes. Um, it's 224 more spaces than the city has right now, but at a cost of up to $17.5 million. And you're probably looking at a two-year term of construction, as far as that goes, with all the displacements that go with that. In addition, again, this is something that the traffic engineer would need to look at and confirm that the roadways can handle the additional load that comes from filling and emptying a facility of that size. But it is one of the options on the table. Is that including? Um, Andy, if I may. Uh, I just want to say, working with Jill, this, that's somewhat of an act of, we're scrunching numbers right now and looking at that. So it's a little bit more than a proposal, but we're hoping that we can make it work, so. We approved, we approved getting the, uh, I'm sorry, Trish. I'm sorry, we, we approved getting the, um, the, surface, the uh, review of the right? Right. The parking garage, the alderman has already approved that. Yeah, that, and it would encompass upgrade, modernization, many of the things, exactly what Mr. Hill is talking about. We're, we're going we're gonna to leave questions to, to the end of each section. Actually, two yeah. slides and we're going to go to questions. Yeah, exactly. And we're only about halfway through, folks, so I just wanted to let you know we, we still have about 45 slides, so. We want to keep it. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> um, one of the options that's been One of the options that's been examined is the idea of putting supported decking 
uh, over some of the lots. Two of the places that would support that uh, are section of the Water Street lot and the Pearson Avenue lot because you have significant changes of grade. It's something you could do that would be reasonably cheap. The displacement would be limited. Uh, it would also be a limited expansion, but it would get you more capacity in a couple of facilities that are highly utilized. Um, so it is one of the options to consider and put on the table. Uh, this could work very well in tandem with the Riverfront Walk project, uh, which is going to take all of the parking that's in La Parc Renaissance out. So you could potentially do this in tandem with that to offset that impact. Um, Andy, can you Okay. Up there now, and I want to just briefly speak to it one more time, just so those folks that could see that slide. So, um, natural change of grade in these two facilities would allow you to put supported deck over the top. Uh, that would gain you 20 spaces at the Water Street site, 34 spaces uh, at the Pearson Avenue site at around $17,000 a space, which is a lot cheaper than 27.5, which is what we were coming out and just base construction costs over at the high street site. So it is a small gain of supply, but it would be lower cost per space here, less of disruption, uh, and it could very well help support the river water project as that starts to be as it displaces uh, some of the existing projects. On the other side of Main Street, the one location that we looked at that's in city ownership and control right now is the Spring Street lot, which actually has the dimensions that you would need to do a fairly efficient structure if you wanted to move forward at the location here. Um, the highest you go is about four levels there. If you go any higher than that, it's going to tower over the adjacent Methodist Church. It's already going to tower over some of the abutting buildings as well. Um, but that would get you uh, about 250 new spaces. Uh, the cost is going to be less than what we were looking at uh, on the high street garage, um, closer to uh, $11 million for that, and a slightly shorter construction period because you don't have to look at all of the demolition and removal first. Um, it would be a large reservoir on the other side of Main Street, which Nashua doesn't have right now. Um, there would be some challenges to this, to this because there are some easements through there to access the private parking lot that's on the other side that would have to be accommodated within the design. Um, but again, this is located in such a way where conceivably it could still service the PAC uh, and the river walk. Um, certainly would help create more capacity for disruptions like the outdoor dining uh, and would add a new reservoir in the downtown. So, let's go to questions, shall we? Yes, sir. Come on down. Get out of here. <laughs> All right. Hi, Vincent Davis, River Casino and Sports Bar. Um, so, we already have a disruption in flow of traffic on High Street um, due to construction of a new apartment building. Is there any further disruption of that flow of traffic with this proposed idea? I would guess that that project's going to be complete before the high street demo and redevelopment would be done. Uh, if you were to get- Done or inconcurrent? Huh? They're, they're slated to be done fall of 2023. So yeah. we're, we're slating this t project to begin after that? Or uh, any- we, we have not looked at timing on this yet, but I will tell you as a design professional, um, just getting through pre-financing design and approvals uh, if we were to start today, we're still a minimum of 12 months out, okay. possibly longer. So um, I can say with some confidence that if this is a road the aldermen decided they wanted to go down on, um, that project would be completed before this project awesome. would initiate. Well, as, as a business, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you for your work. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, before you go, though, I did want to just put that yeah. out. This is part of the presentation. Um, I did want to let you know that we have started a small trial over at the High Street Garage with lowering the lighting. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that yet. We did select um, two of the lower floors over there. 
um, where we'd actually drop down the lighting and in on one side we actually uh, replace the current fixtures with LED fixtures. Mm -hmm. um, so not just LED tubes, but the fixtures themselves. Um, so when you get a chance, check it out. I want, I want to get some feedback from the public. For sure. Um, I'm going to take some, some additional after pictures on some of the cloudy days. I'm waiting for a cloudy day. Not that I want a cloudy day because <laughs> I'm enjoying. Not this week. We've had enough. <laughs> We've had enough for a while. But um, so I, I hope to present some of those um, before and after pictures the next time we have a, uh, we're invited over to the infrastructure and PDC meeting. So we'll be sharing that and hopefully um, having some pricing to share with the committees and yeah. uh, to hopefully move forward with the plan there. So anyways, I just awesome. wanted to no, let you know no, that. No, we, you we thank you. And like I said, we're in, we're in full support of, of any forward progress. We're just, you know, we're, our business is down. We're trying to figure it out. We want a safe place for, for our patrons. And again, you know, we're, we're here for, for these nonprofits and, and it's really affecting them. So, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a strong head in the game of, of wanting to make sure we're performing for, you know, what we're doing for these nonprofits. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, any questions from? Nope. Okay. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to keep bothering you. Um, one of the things about the expansion is, and it kind of goes in conjunction with what you're talking about with the, the wayfaring and that there are parking lots that are city lots that people don't even realize. Um, when a lot of the stuff happened, one of the things I found, didn't even know, was the parking lot behind the taxi stand. And, and I think people don't even understand that that's a, a multi-unit um, place. It looks like it's owned by the, the taxi stand. So I think one of the things we almost need to put up is not just how to get there, but once you're there to put up a sign that says city parking. Um, because right next to it are two private parking lots. Um, that people don't understand they can't go into without a permit and will get ticketed and so on. So I think the expansion is extremely important and it's going to come on the aldermen to try to come up with the money and a plan. But um, I think a quick way also is to get people into those lots because I can always find parking in that lot. And I'm always parking there because it's, it's easy enough for me to find and no one knows it's there. <laughs> so um, I think that's one of the things that we really do have to do better is get people to those lots. And when they're in that area to say, this is the one. I think there's maybe like 10 or 12 parking spaces there, but it's still a lot that people don't even realize that are there. So thanks. Go ahead, Roger. Um, yes, Roger Set, 20 Marshall Street. Now, you talked about doing like the angle parking, parking spaces on Main Street. Main Street had that many years ago, and they didn't have the little islands that they have now. So if you were to do that, you'd have to eliminate the islands out of the way or just leave the parking as it is. And then you talk about upgrading the parking garage. Are the parking garages tall enough to fit a fire truck in there if there's a fire in there? That would be the other concern. You know, you talk about lighting and all this, but if you have a medical emergency, does an ambulance fit in there? Does a fire truck fit in there? You know, those are the other questions that I would like to know. Would you like to? If I can get my mic on. There we go. Um, much of this is related into what we discussed with the barriers there. If you're talking about Main Street, <clears throat> that, this has been sanctioned with the approval of the National Police Department and with the National Fire Department. As a former member of the National Fire Department, I can assure you that the attitude of that and profession of that particular department would not recommend anything that would cause any particular concern uh, to the life safety. And again, like in the example <coughs> that Mr. Hill brought up, where Conk had modified their plans to two lanes, that was equally addressed when they looked at that. And if we're going to look at angle parking, uh, is it not maybe the barriers are a good way to get down to the two lanes to give us a fair way to look at it in comparison at the same time. So everything that we're discussing here tonight, you got to keep in mind to focus on one particular thing. It's much like putting a puzzle together. Each piece is interconnected and if something works, it doesn't work, the uh, whole situation is flexible. But as it stands right now, I can assure the public 
because uh, I take the uh, recommendations of uh, Chief Buxton extremely serious. If there was anything affecting the life safety of our citizens, it would be uh, immediately uh, mitigated. I can assure you of that. So we talked about the ability for the city to expand uh, parking on its own properties or footprints. One of the things that may be available as development continues to go on through the area is public-private partnerships. Um, this is a way for a, a municipality to pair with a private developer to build more parking as part of an overall development plan. In terms of dimensions, um, all you really need is a footprint of around 120 feet wide by 210 feet long to do a reasonably efficient and reasonably cost-effective parking structure that will get you about 78 spaces per floor. Um, there are lots of private parcels all over the city that potentially would have those kinds of dimensions if they ever went into development uh, to support something like that. Please keep in mind that in order to get any type of uh, positive net return in terms of total spaces, you're probably looking uh, with displacement of having to go up about at least two supported levels in order to get a net gain. Um, where this is done, and this is done in a lot of communities, typically it uh, is done by creating enabling uh, legislation first, which allows for the community to engage in a public-private uh, public venture. Sometimes, um, depending on the structure of the deal, uh, the um, municipality is taking the lead in terms of uh, permitting and design. Sometimes they're just buying a portion of the project out when it's completed. Sometimes they're actually engaging to create a third-party special purpose entity in order to take the project through uh, design and development and construction here. Um, there are a lot of different models as far as that goes. Well, before I go to the next slide, I want to caution you. This is for illustrative purposes only. <laughs> We've not put any pins in any maps saying this is where we're going to do this. I just wanted to show in terms of dimensions and variety of sites, the number of places where if you could get a private partner, uh, you have the ability to put in structured parking uh, all, over, all over the city in different locations. Some of these locations have actually been called out as prospective locations for public-private venture and other plans. If you look at the riverfront plan, that's got a couple of different locations noted in it. Uh, Imagine 2021 has a couple of different locations noted in it where it's recommended to look at a public-private partnership. Um, what this does illustrate is the variety of locations that are available when you start looking at this versus the very small number of locations that the city's looking at it if they just go it, uh, go it alone, if you will. And like I said, the structure is very variable. The role that the city can play uh, goes everywhere from a, a bit player who's buying out a portion of the project at the end to a uh, fully equal partner through each stage of the project here. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through this other than to show you that there are lots of different ways to, for lack of a better term, skin this particular cat. So this, if this is a road that Nashua decides to go down, they can probably find a structure that works for them with virtually any developer that comes in. Uh, and it is a um, vehicle that works. Uh, this has been a successful venture uh, in Portsmouth. The Foundry Garage was a public-private venture. Um, in Concord, the Capital Commons Garage was also a public-private venture. We work directly on the garage that you see in the upper left-hand side in Biddeford, Maine to bring that forward. That's part of a larger, complete redevelopment of the riverfront area. <clears throat> Haverhill right now is out looking for a partner to eliminate uh, 
an existing deck that they've got and bring in structured parking to support redevelopment there. So uh, this is not without precedent. concept or this idea moving forward. Okay. Hearing none, um, let's talk about how you can incent private investment in uh, parking and transportation infrastructure. And it really comes down to a question of carrots and sticks. use uh, have included things like um, very often uh, they will bring parking in as part of their project or bring transportation improvements as part of their projects uh, because the tenant has demanded it or because the lender is requiring it here there are a number of communities that have offered tax abatements uh, if you bring in certain components with the project uh, a lot of projects now pursue this, um, especially uh, the introduction of transportation components because it is part of getting an accreditation uh, for LEED, which is a sustainability accreditation that comes with a lot of, of, um, a lot of buildings here. So those are the carrots. On the stick side, the number one mechanism that most communities have used historically is the establishment of parking minimums. Um, and I'm going to talk in a minute about how that potentially could work or one model that has been used in a lot of other communities here. Um, some communities have addressed this by basically saying uh, there are only certain allowable uses we allow to come in without providing their own parking. And then they put a condition on those uses that have to provide their own parking. Uh, there are a few communities here in New England that have gone with a flat ad valorem or impact fee uh, with development to help offset the cost of bringing new development in when it's on the city's hook to provide the parking or the transportation infrastructure. So one of the methodologies that's been used in a lot of communities that mixes uh, the carrots and sticks are to introduce parking minimums, um, usually market-specific parking minimums, and I want to make this very clear. These are uh, parking requirements that have been studied extensively in existing land uses, so they're not onerous. They're appropriate for the use. Um, so it's just the parking that that development might need. <clears throat> so they set that standard. These are X number of minimum spaces that need to come with your development. Now, Mr. Developer, if you're willing to engage in some of these different practices, you can actually take some or all of your parking requirement off the table. For example, if you can build a development where you can demonstrate you need half of what our parking requirements say you need, because you have a mix of uses that can share that space, say a hotel next to an office building where the office building needs all of its parking during the day but is empty at night, and the hotel needs the majority of its parking during the night but is empty during the day, um, you can qualify for waivers against those requirements by doing that type of development. If you come in and you find a neighbor who has 50 spaces that they're not using in the middle of the day when you need them, and they agree to sign a contract to allow you to use those, that will allow you to qualify to meet your parking requirements. Um, if you're willing to bring in uh, a car share service, like a zip car, will knock four spaces off of uh, your requirement for every car share that you bring in. Uh, if you're willing to provide bicycle uh, infrastructure will knock X number of spaces. You get the idea. It's a trade back and forth for you providing certain components. We're willing to grant certain waivers. These are all the carrots associated with that stick. Uh, there are some communities that have gone as far as getting to the point where they will actually allow developers to buy out of their parking requirement. It's called an in-lieu payment. And those funds typically go into a dedicated fund that's used to provide parking infrastructure or transportation infrastructure within that downtown district that accepted that payment here. And it's a way for 
uh, the city to gather some money to help make these improvements going forward. Um, The city carries uh, language that allows for interdevelopment shared parking. There is loose language in there, although not necessarily a methodology, that would allow for uh, somebody to come in with uh, a shared use between two different parties in order to meet their parking needs. However, Nashua has no parking requirements in the downtown right now. So, uh, you're really relying on the goodwill of developers to come in and introduce uh, these measures. Now where this plays into a bigger picture is in a lot of communities, um, the reason they've instituted this is not necessarily uh, because they want to punish developers to create a barrier, but do they want to create infrastructure to support that transition. You know, we talked about going to multimodal. There are a lot of pieces and parts that need to go with that. Uh, if you can get private parties to provide some of those parts, bike cages, showering facilities for people who want a bike, uh, guaranteed free ride home for people who want to ride share, uh, that means that the city has revenues to focus on the bigger pictures like building bike lanes, busways, that type of thing. So this is how that works in sort of a little bit about programs. Uh, it's not just building bike cages or sidewalks. You also need to reduce barriers for folks living in car lifestyle where they're not solely dependent on their personal vehicle all the time. You need to think about ways to make uh, that more appealing by offering them safety net programs like uh, Uber vouchers if uh, they need to run out and, and do an errand or membership in a car share service if they've got to run to a meeting or on-site childcare, things along those lines help to facilitate uh, that type of movement. Um, and they can all be used to gain credit toward those parking minimums or some other type of goal or objective the city has laid out. So I know it's very, very high level and very fast, um, but uh, I did want to be able to cover that and at least get you folks exposed to that. Does anybody have questions on what I've outlined right now? And I know this is a 10,000 foot level. That's what we're sort of dealing with right now. Um, but we wanted to at least put the concept out to the general public and start soliciting some feedback on whether you think that that is something that's going to fly in Nashua or not. Alderman Cleek. I'm such a pest, and um, you, you use the word barrier a few times, and barrier is a four-letter word in Nashua. So um, you really meant like hindrance. Obstacle. Meant, obstacle. Yes. Thank you. An I just want to make sure. To, yes, yes. Sorry. Thank yes. You. Not a concrete bar barrier, but more of a psychological <laughs> obstacle you. to going car light. Okay. All right, hearing no questions on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight was the idea of shared use. We touched about this a little bit. Um, shared use is the idea that uh, multiple uses can share the same space um, in order to accommodate their needs. The image that you see in the lower left is an example of Boston style shared use. That's the idea that multiple cars can share the same space at the same time. Um, Everywhere else, what we really try and look for is a way to get the most utility out of each existing space uh, by encouraging use by complementary uses. And there are some examples there of actual signage or actual programs that are in place that allow for multiple uses to use. Um, Shared use, folks, is, is going on in your downtown right now. It's just not going on with endorsement. Uh, if you've ever come down and parked in the Santander Bank lot after hours uh, to, to patronize one of the restaurants in the area here, that's shared use. It's just not sanctioned shared use. There's no sign up there saying you're welcome to do that, 
um, you're doing it at risk, but it is happening on a regular basis. Having done observations through this area, there are dozens of examples like that just up and down Main Street here. What formalizing that agreement does is it gives both parties some sense of structure and safety in order to engage in those practices here and protection from potential liabilities. Um, the way that this would typically work in a community like Nashua is that the shared use agreement would be struck between a private party and the city, and the city would agree to police use of that when they had access to that facility to make sure that everybody's playing by the appropriate rules. Now, Alderman Clee, this is where your concerns come in. Because while we have just a very limited number of on-street spaces across French Hill, there are a lot of privately held off-street facilities that are grossly underutilized. In fact, in every segment of the study area, we have seen typical utilization levels after hours and on weekends in the 25% or lower except for a handful of locations. So one of the solutions to our overnight parking challenges may be for the city to pursue these agreements with willing property owners to negotiate to add those facilities as a limited use overnight parking facility that would be managed and enforced by the city to create that capacity, especially in constrained areas, so that uh, folks could find parking if they can't get an on-street program that will meet their needs. So we think that this is one of the potential solutions that might be available to us on this overnight. owner um, and they are in concept amicable to this type of uh, this type of arrangement here of course pending any number of negotiations and approvals but in concept they like it and they think it might be a benefit to them and the community so I think there is appetite out there um, this uh, collection of signage here is um, an illustration on, on a point, which is the reason you need to execute these often is so that you can put up signage that lets folks know that these, this use is allowed. Every one of these locations, when you talk to the property owner, would tell you that they engage in shared use and that their facility is open to the general public on off hours. If you look at those signs, there's no indication that that's the case. We do a very good job with our parking signage of letting folks know what's not allowed and not always a great job of letting them know what is allowed. Um, so that would have to be a critical part of this. So, does anybody have any questions on shared use? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Holly Drew. I work over off Pine Street Extension. We have a business over there in one of the big mill buildings. Um, very family oriented, down low income families. We supervise visits and all, and they can't. Um, a couple years ago, you guys put signs saying that you're gonna have us stop paying to park. Is would one of those signs work for us that employees could use that parking lot, and anybody else that doesn't work in the building would have to pay, or what does that look like? <coughs> Like I saw it said, um, employee parking only. Is that something? Uh, I believe that that was taken in Harrisonburg, Virginia. So do you know the parking lot I'm talking about? Yeah, off? I yeah. know the Mill Cove lot. I have not seen the sign you're referring to. It was up within, I don't know, an hour since they told us the parking lot was changing over owners. Yeah. So. I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to just. Yeah. So she's talking about the uh, the pay, um, the pay signs that we had okay. put into the parking lot over there at the Pine Street Extension, um, when the, when the ownership had come back to the city, that was the initial plan. However, knowing that we were undergoing this parking study, 
we paused. And so that's why we're looking at these things now. So, so nothing's happening yet, but yes, I, I completely understand. Do you know what the time frame would be on knowing something? We just, we worry about our clients because they can't afford to park. So, so. so nothing's happening immediately, I can assure you of that. I mean, I don't think anything would happen even within the next, maybe even six months to a year. I mean, it, it is a process that would, okay. everything would have to go through. Okay. Legislation would have to be filed. Um, <clears throat> this study has to conclude first. Proposed legislation would have to be brought forth, then it would be vetted through those bodies okay. um, before anything would do. And we would certainly be sure to give ample notice to the public before anything would go into place over there. And most likely we would reach out and have some, um, you know, outreach session <coughs> meetings and, and come okay. and meet with the folks So over we're not, because the signs went up so fast, we're kind of freaking out about you guys are just going to start charging us and we have to pay $40 a week to park where we work and the families and... No, no. So we, we paused specifically for that reason. We knew that there was, there was a need for that. Um, with that being said, though, we do know that we do need to have some management in place over there in order to pay for the repairs of the lot, lighting, yeah. and things like that. <laughs> Plowing so we, we would be good. We do have to get a mechanism in place at some point <laughs> okay. to, to pay for some of those costs. But absolutely, we would, we would definitely reach out ahead of time and make sure everybody was, had plenty of notice before anything went into place. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. just, have look, just had a look at my note to see what I wrote. The parking signs. We already have some of these. Um, even like for the city. So for instance, the parking behind the library, when you've got to go past the, as, as it was referred to, the, the, pi the pirate uh, towers and so on, um, there's a parking lot back there. Most people don't even realize that it's back there. The signs are getting very old, and I think it says uh, from, from like 9 a.m. or till 7 p.m. Some say 6 p.m., some say 7 p.m. Um, those are the types of signs that you're talking about where people know when they can't park there, but they don't realize that after seven, they can now park there. In behind, like where the surf was and those little lots there, it used to say no parking from, or reserved parking from this time to this time. The lots say the same thing. People don't realize that after those times, they are allowed to park there. And I do think that we do need to put up some signage that would do that. As far as shared parking in French Hill, I do know of some landlords that are working with some other um, uh, surface lot people, owners. Um, some of the complaints, and this is an issue that they need to deal with their tenants, is that the tenant feels that they have to walk too far. And there's a perfectly good spot not being used in front of the building. Um, so those are some of the issues that we kind of, the calls that I would get from like an alderman and so on. But I, I'm really glad to hear about this shared um, kind of parking, because you're right, there are a lot of open lots, <clears throat> some in not such great shape, but there's still a lot of open lots that aren't being utilized. So thank you for pursuing that. Yeah. Um, if I may, in the, uh, Mr. Heller should say, and the Joe, Ms. Dansfield, uh, this is why as the chairman of the Committee of Infrastructure, why we didn't blanket the city in. We could have, you know, but this, this is too big of an issue. And it needs to be taken piecemeal and to look and, you know, like I say, it goes back to the puzzle theory of each individual pieces. And I couldn't agree with you more, Alderman Clay. You know, things were changed, but to change them now, we haven't really achieved the final, let us get the first down first, then we'll figure out whether we're going to punt or go for a field goal, you know, so you know, we'll have to see. But, because uh, there's a lot of work, and if we keep changing things midstream, we'll lose some of it, so it, it is work in progress. So I ask the people to uh, bear patience with us. Uh, you gotta understand a lot of our ar architecture, particularly in the downtown, was intended to be one to two family homes. Now they're housing multiple uh, tenants. Yet, you know, many of those people when it's one to two uh, homes, they didn't have cars, you know. 60 years ago, and the buildings are still there, and people have vehicles, and uh, what is it, right now we have, we register more cars than we actually have linear parking spaces for, so it's, it, this is a, I want the people to know, a very much more, and I appreciate Mr. Hill for biting into the apple, but it's a very extremely difficult to try to look at it, and this has so far been enlightening to work towards this, because it's, uh, uh, let's face it, folks, Nashua grew up. 
and, and, and this is part of the, uh, part of the issue. Uh, we're facing things that maybe Cambridge or somebody else faced 50 years ago. It's coming home here to Nashua now. So, thank you. Thank you for indulging me for a second. One of the things that people don't understand is that our um, rules and regulations say for every uh, rented unit, you have to have 1.5 parking spaces. That means if you've got two rented units, you just have to have three parking spaces. But let's be honest, there's going to be four cars. So now what do they do with the other car? They got approved to get something with three cars and somebody moves in and now they're scrambling to get this other. And that's where the frustration is. And that's why this, what you're doing, you know, um, with Ms. Stanfield, with um, Alderman um, O'Brien are doing is, is extremely important to kind of look at the whole thing. And I want to reiterate what um, Alderman O'Brien said. It's important for us to look at the whole big picture. If we can start doing some things now, that would be great, but we can't do it if it's going to create an impediment to getting the big picture fixed. We can't take little bites if we really need to eat the entire apple. So thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate it. We good? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, safety and security. Let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> I had had a plan for the next slide in, in, uh, in its original format where I was going to invite this group to engage in a little bit of quiz to see uh, what their answers would be, because there are a lot of perceptions about parking. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tap a button and have these answers fly in. So um, a lot of people would assume, based on um, common social perception, parking facilities are very unsafe. Uh, these are statistics that were all compiled from the 2020 uh, Federal Bureau of Investigations uh, crime statistics. Uh, model and they record uh, crimes which they generally group into one of three categories uh, crimes against person crimes against property or crimes against society uh, try crimes against persons are the worst kind um, homicide assault battery etc cetera, etc cetera. if you were to ask a room people full of people how many uh, what percentage of crime you think happens in parking facilities that are crimes against persons. In my experience in other forums, you'll see people raise their hands and say 20%, 30%. It's 4%. 4% of crimes last year actually occurred in parking facilities. Um, crimes against person. 11% occurred as crimes against property. And uh, just 8% uh, were uh, crimes against society. That's things like uh, drug use, um, gambling, et cetera, et cetera, here. These statistics often surprise people because parking has a very bad reputation, if you will. In point of fact, uh, if you have no other fun facts you can take home from this, take home this, you're actually statistically uh, more exposed and, and at risk in your own home or in the street in front of your own home than you are in a parking facility by a significant factor. Um, so why is parking uh, considered so unsafe and scary? Well, part of it is absolutely lighting. Uh, when parking facilities were first starting to be built and assembled and put out there, uh, the common lighting element was high pressure sodium. You see that on your left in the before picture. It's orange. It lasts for a long time, but it's not very uniform. It's a low light source. Uh, it creates a lot of shadows. It creates a general feeling of unease. The newest stuff, the state of the art stuff uh, that the city's starting to install in their garages now is LED. It's a whiter, brighter, lighter light. It has greater uniformity. Joe was talking about the experiment of lowering the lights. The reasons we want to lower the lights in the garages is because uh, the way that the garage is constructed, it has recesses where the structural members go up and the lights have been mounted flush against those recesses up in a pocket. What happens is the walls for those structural members limit the spread of the light. So you get light patch, dark patch, light patch, dark patch. 
It means people can feel, can't see as clearly as far. It feels darker. It feels scarier by lowering the lights. You, you expand um, the light penetration. It's more uniform. People feel safer, if you will, uh, because they have better visual acuity at this point. So um, certainly one of the things that we can look at in, in terms of addressing that is lighting improvements. Now, another thing is perimeter control. Um, a a well-built parking facility, whether it's a surface lot or a parking garage, typically has only a few points of access and egress, uh, which is actually to your benefit because if you can keep eyes on those points of access and egress, you can see everybody who comes in and goes out. If you want to further control that perimeter, there are products and services that are available out on the market. Uh, you can see uh, some examples of security grading that have been used in some urban locations which actually create a barrier so that folks can't enter through any of the openings that are there for ventilation and light here. Uh, you can limit those folks to just coming in and out of uh, vehicle doors or pedestrian access doors. If you want to take that not one, lap, one step further, uh, you can set up the vehicle doors with some of the gates and the doors that you see above. Uh, in the center here is a high-speed overhead door that's made out of Lexan. Uh, it's see-through, but it is uh, crash-proof for vehicles here. Uh, it's very fast. It goes up and down in about two seconds here. So. Uh, you have the ability to let vehicles in, let vehicles out, but be able to secure the perimeter of the facility and particularly that portal if you want. Um, the lift doors are another example. Those actually swing up like this. Uh, the perimeter fencing that you see around that surface lot in the corner is Lowell, Massachusetts. And again, it's another way to reduce the number of ways that somebody can get in and out of a facility. Uh, if you really want to go high tech, you can lock down your facility and then uh, if it's a gated facility, you can issue barcode credentials. They can be on a phone, they can be on a piece of paper, they can be on the ticket that you pull as you come into the facility, but you can put a barcode reader next to the doors that folks exit out of that latch automatically behind them and when they come back, if they want to get in, they have to present that barcode credential in order for the door to unlock to let them in. So there are a lot of ways we can go to improve perimeter control if that's the way we want to go. Now I will tell you, it's a double-edged sword. Um, it's very effective when it comes to preventing intrusion, uh, but when you see this walking down a street, is your first impression that this is a particularly safe area, or is your first impression that you should really be on your guard because if they're already securing the parking garages, it's, it could be a rough neighborhood. It's the same thing with call boxes. They serve a very active security concern, but they have some passive perception issues uh, that could actually work against you here. Um, that said, I wanted to trot this out in front of the community so that we could get some feedback on this and see what the appetite is. The number one thing uh, that you can add to your facility uh, that will increase your security more than cameras, more than call boxes, more than screens are people. The more activity you have within a facility, the more activity you have on the street, the more eyes you have there, uh, the safer it will feel. Um, some of the ways that those have been done, you can always hire a security guard, but a lot of municipalities have had luck with bringing in their janitorial crew uh, during periods when the garage is at a low ebb of activity. That works for the janitorial crew because they don't have to work around people, and it also presents a live person in that facility so as folks are coming back late night, they don't feel like they're in the facility all by themselves. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can put in um, rovers and downtown ambassadors that are there to pass through the facility from time to time. They're not security guards. They're really there to assist. But again, they're another eye on the ground. If you want to go even further than that, uh, in gated facilities, you can actually install central cashiers so that there's somebody there all the time in the elevator lobby. 
Uh, the critical piece here is just getting more presence into those facilities here. Um, in terms of improving um, the feeling of safety on the street, <laughs> I really didn't have to write or think much about this because so many of the studies that you've already done address all of these uh, in great detail and how you can go about affecting those. Um, things like improving lighting along the sidewalks, uh, getting uh, wider sidewalks, promoting more activity on the street, uh, introducing residential development into an area so there are more eyes on the street, uh, getting more activated uses. Many of these things are actually already happening with the development that's coming into the area. So you're on your way and you have a good road map as far as it goes. Now we just need to figure out how to get the funds to execute it. So any questions on these potential enhancements? We're in the end, folks. We're getting there. Almost there. Um, parking enforcement. We've talked about why we're, in parking for, we're interested in parking enforcement, but I really wanted to give uh, a very clear idea of the scope of the issue. Uh, one of the things we did is we took a look at all of the areas that the city needs to cover in order to effectively enforce the policies that are in place. And you can see the collections up there. It's late. I'm not going to walk you through them. Other than I will tell you, in order to enforce the rules and regulations that you have in place right now, you need the equivalent of about 112 hours of labor a week in order to do that. That's three full-time parking enforcement officers doing just that, parking enforcement, nothing else. Um, the parking department does not have that staffing in hand at this point in time. And in order to affect that level of enforcement and address some of the issues we've heard, we're going to have to expand that staff. Now, there are other ways uh, to do this besides just uh, throwing more people at them. Um, we talked a little bit about the idea of gating garages that would take a significant number of spaces that have to be controlled to make sure that people have permits and they've paid off of the table, reduces the area you've got to cover, you reduce the area you've got to cover, you reduce the manpower you need in order to put it out there. Um, one of the things that's been a force multiplier in other locations is uh, license plate recognition technology. These are cameras that get mounted on the top of a car. Uh, you drive up and down a street, the cameras capture the plate on the car, digitize it, run it against a set of databases to either figure out you paid for your parking, you have a permit, or um, you have not paid for your parking, you have an outstanding ticket. Um, it can alert on all of those things and signify to the patrol agent here that you need to stop because there's an issue here. Uh, in terms of force multiplier, it will take uh, the amount of time that you need to spend to cover one area, and it can cut it by as much as 67%. So it's like adding two-thirds of a person. The challenge that we have right now is within the state of New Hampshire currently, uh, this type of technology is not allowed for parking enforcement, just for law enforcement. So in order to bring this to the table, the first step would be taking this up to the State House to see what we can do about getting a change of legislation that would allow this. Uh, if we want to, um, there, there is another way. If, if you want to uh, do something that is allowable today, uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that a lot of your single head meters are getting old and you're going to need to replace them soon. Uh, the new meters now are state-of-the-art technology. They will allow you to accept credit cards, debit cards. They link with your pay-by-phone app. You can use Google Pay. You can use Apple Pay. And some of them will even tell you if there's a car parked there or not and if that car is parked uh, after the meter has expired. In fact, one of the meters that you see up there, right in the middle, that uh, kind of uh, oval um, gray thing with the two green dots on it. The green dots are indicators that say that those spaces are paid. If you look down that face, you'll see two long black 
uh, rectangles right in the middle of that face. What you may not be able to tell from there is those are cameras. This is an installation in Dedham, Massachusetts, and those cameras actually uh, capture the plate and start recording the time when the vehicle parks. They communicate to the meter whether the meter has been paid or whether it's expired, and it has the ability to then communicate out to a parking enforcement officer and where it's allowed in some jurisdictions can actually capture the plate and allow that individual to issue a ticket later on based on the photographic evidence. Um, so that's sort of uh, the top level of what you can do with this. Lower levels use uh, sonic technology that uh, those are the things, that the, the boxes that you see just below the meters uh, in the upper right and lower left or they use uh, pucks that detect the presence of a vehicle and then communicate back to the meter. Uh, again, this is a way to get point in time uh, communication out. So rather than having to patrol, your parking enforcement officer is now just going from point to point to point and addressing issues as the system alerts him. Any questions on this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the meters that you showed there, um, does that, um, like for instance, the old-fashioned meters that we had, um, you could leave time on it and there would be people that would hunt looking for an unspent meter to kind of help subsidize. One of the nice things about the, from the city wise, <laughs> the nice things about the card ones is that uh, you get a ticket and even if it says that you have an extra hour on it, it doesn't matter the next person doesn't get that extra hour, they have to pay for their own time. That's one of the, the questions and comments. So those meters that you were talking about that had the cameras and so on, does that, um, if someone leaves, so does it change that little green light to red? Yeah, it okay. zeroes it out. Where these meters are linked to detectors, whenever the vehicle leaves the spot, if there's still time on the meter, when they leave that spot, the meter zeroes out and starts again from scratch. Okay. The other question is one of the, um, and I'm sure Jill has heard this a lot, um, those meters that don't take money, um, there are a lot of people that are technology challenged or just don't have it. They don't have a smartphone or they don't have that type of technology and they need to be able to have a way of um, being able to do that. They don't have credit cards. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people that only have cash. I find that foreign because I never have cash. <laughs> but I live by plastic, but the, that is a real thing for, for some people, and especially people even who live and work in the downtown area, they're used to doing the coins or, or whatever. So would there be an alternate to, for something like that? No, because all the smart meters take coins as well. Oh, they do take yes. coins. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. And the other thing um, about um, staffing for Jill, uh, we recently had a meeting and one of the things that I had said to Director Cummings was, let her go wild and tell us what, she, what her best wish were. And he said that she'd be frothing at the mouth and be very, very excited about it. But one of the things that I have to say is that part of when we took parking enforcement from the police, because it was a burden to them and the city said, okay, we'll do it, and we'll do the tickets and so on, was that we made it budget neutral. So what we received from parking and so on helped pay for it. So if we did put those 3.0 FTE in, we would have to find a way of being able to pay for it. So whether it would be taking the, the recent parking lot from the mill and having to lease those spaces out for by the month of some sort, we would have to, and I'm just saying this more for the public than for you, we can't just go higher because that was one of the promises we made of trying to keep it budget neutral. We'd have to t change our plan um, is one of the things that I just want to get out to the people. We need the help in parking enforcement. I know people are complaining, they say they always get the answer machine, but that's because you all are out patrolling the streets and someone say, well, they've never patrolled my street, people are parking here all the time at night. You do your best job to hit as many streets as you can, but you can't hit every street every 24 hours and you can't always be there at the same time. So you have a list of streets that tend to be problem children and you focus on those and then kind of do a run through. You know, I'm saying this more for the public because of the criticism that I think parking enforcement gets. They're doing the best job with what little they have and 
I know I appreciate all the do that they do in Ward 3, so thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I appreciate it. We appreciate yes, it. Yes, ma'am. Would you mind going back to the previous slide for my question, the one with the picture of the uh, parking meters? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, in the 12 o'clock position gray parking meter that you referenced, you mentioned that the machine has the capability to take the picture of the license plate of the vehicle once it is in violation. Is that currently within uh, limitations of New Hampshire law or would that also need to be taken for legislature at a state level to be utilized? I, I am not 100% sure. My guess is if the state has not authorized the use of LPR for parking enforcement, there are probably not uh, laws in the books that allow for that function. That's why I said, if allowable by jurisdiction, I don't think New Hampshire is one of the states that allows that yet. Yeah, and Andy, Andy if yeah. I may. Um, <clears throat> being a state rep, I also wrote the law for, uh, perhaps if you traveled Route 3 North, uh, you went through uh, the area in Hutchett where you didn't go through Tobles. I wrote the law where the camera could take that particular picture and you know record and everything else. But that was years ago, and our technology is evolving as we speak, and nobody really focused on the parking meter. And so what you bring up is a good question. It needs to be researched, both as a committee and legally, and check existing state law, and maybe additional state law, like we had to write to have that you know no tow booth access that hooks it. And it's the same thing for the Bedford tolls, because even though the toll booths are there, you're not going through the attendant or drop and change anymore. The camera is recorded. Your only takes a picture during the violation, and the state can only keep it for uh, a minimum amount of time. If with no violation, if you violate, then that's a different issue. But at this point, this recommendation is hypothetical because it has not been researched for legal ability within our current laws that, is what I was trying to clarify that that feature would not be available to you off the bat okay yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. Uh, strategies for improving communications and this is just ways that um, the city can get more information out in the hands of constituents to make good decisions. Um, Alderman O'Brien was just talking about the advances in technology. One of the things that's on the cutting edge in parking right now is the use of spatial recognition technology in order to do monitoring of occupancy in parking lots or and or uh, along public streets. Um, it's a very simple system. Uh, there is a set of cameras that are calibrated to do this type of detection using visual image uh, that shoot down into an area. You can see that in the upper left-hand corner. That's a, an example of the type of readout that comes from these systems. Um, you can see on the right-hand corner, that's an illustration of how they work. And then at the bottom, a little bit closer, is an integrated uh, overhead light and camera system here. What these will allow you to do is capture utilization and feed that real time to a handheld app, to a website, et cetera. So as folks are talking about uh, wanting to find available parking in a particular area, uh, this is one of the tools that could be available to them in order to commu communicate where there's available parking and uh, make the most of the existing assets that you've got. In doing the operational assessment on the parking department, um, one of the things that the parking department isn't doing right now, and they're not unique in this here, is um, communicating mission and milestones. A lot of parking departments are just focused on uh, keeping the doors open, the lights on, and the trains running on time. But as we all know, especially in the current age, uh, from time to time, you also need to be able to tell your constituency what you're doing for them, because otherwise, in the absence of that information, 
there can be assumptions that are made. One of the vehicles that's available to doing this is just doing an annual report, which details how the system performed, uh, how many vehicles you serviced um, during the course of a given year, uh, tickets issued, uh, improvements that were made, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very useful tool as far as a reference for folks. So when they want to understand what the parking system is doing for them, they can go through and see it for themselves and inspect that. Um, this is something that's very popular in the larger parking systems. Uh, you, you can see the cover for the 2021 report for the Baltimore Parking Authority, but it's not unusual in smaller systems as well. It's becoming more commonplace. Pismo Beach, San Luis Abismo, uh, California, and even uh, little Durham, North, North New Hampshire are now issuing annual reports in the state of their parking system so that their constituents are aware of what's happening with it, where it's going, uh, its stated mission and its ability to meet those mission, that mission as it's uh, going along. It would also save the city money by not having to hire somebody like me. Um, Alderman Klee, you were actually talking about this earlier and you stole a little bit of my, my thunder, but I, I appreciate the preview here. Um, in looking at wayfinding, you have done some extensive work uh, in procurement on installing new themed wayfinding. Uh, as we were looking at the system, um, the two things that we thought might be a gap in the system right now, uh, one of them was um, signage for pedestrians once they get out of a car. It's not unusual at all to have a wayfinding system very focused on getting people off of the highway, onto the right street, and into the facility, and then you're kind of on your own. Um, one of the ways to address this is to look at installing signage either within the facilities or at various decision points along the way that help folks locate. I'm here this is this business here, that's that street over there, this is how I get there, and especially in the case of something that's at decision points, this is how I get back to where I parked as well. Uh, some of the examples you see up on your screen, this is not something you're seeing in major cities. In the upper left-hand side is an illustration that's in all of the facilities in Plymouth, Massachusetts. At the bottom, is a uh, illustration and a map that's put out by Durham, New Hampshire. You see it the minute you come off the train um, and or at certain locations uh, around the perimeter of the city. At the upper corner here, that's uh, Bastrop, Texas, that put out those types of kiosks with those maps uh, at, at key decision points. Uh, the other thing that certainly would help, and we've talked about this already, making it clear uh, what the rules of use are within the facility here. In the middle is a sign that I took while I was in Battle Creek, Michigan. And it's very interesting because uh, the colors that you see on that sign actually correspond to striping within the facility. So you can look and see the rules and then literally you can see which facilities are subject to these rules at different times here. So it's very easy to figure out where you can and cannot park and under what conditions. So that's communications. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I, I do like the annual report thing, but one of the things that um, I use when I go into larger cities, mind you, Baltimore, Boston, and so on, are like parking apps that tell me where the, the parking lots are, where we have a lot of small lots and so on. Would something like that even work, um, do you think, in Nashua? Um, I, and these are really kind of like private, you know, um, parking lots. I, I know in Manchester, they, they use a parking app for that parking garage, but I'm talking about when I'm trying to find a space, right. you know, and then I kind of prepay for that space and I, I go there and it's all, um, and, I, and I've talked to some people that have asked it. And I thought Nash was a little small for something like that, but have we ever looked at anything such as that that might help? Um, it, it might help people even to find a parking, find where the parking lots are. We talk about Wayfair, I mean, doing something like that, I know it would be a whole IT development, but I think it would help people. 
I get on the website and I send people the parking maps all the time. We have that great parking map with all the different colors. It says what the zones are so that they know what they have to pay for. But if there's actually an app that kind of said, I'm here, how can I get there? And so on, I think that might help. So there are, there are a number of things that are in the works um, that might address that. To start with, I, I want to clarify, the, I think the applications you were describing were what we referred to as reservation apps. Yes. Um, yeah. Those are usually put out by aggregator sites that go into a major municipality and allow people to purchase parking ahead of time. They right. can't necessarily reserve a space, but they can reserve a facility within a space and right. prepay for it. Right. Um, you don't see that in communities of Nashua's side because most of the time there's a profit motive for the people who are providing that service. They're getting a piece of the action. And the rates here just aren't. Uh, yeah. high enough to make an incentive of that. Now, that being said, um, with something like the, uh, the space detection or occupancy detection information we're talking about, that usually comes paired with an app so that it's part of the service, so that people can look at that and see there's available space there. If you don't want to go that high tech, um, Google Earth is, uh, Google, I should say, in, in the subdivision of a Google Earth uh, is now rapidly rolling out uh, a service that will allow folks to identify the location of public parking uh, and pick up information from that. So if you're using a Google Map function, uh, you'll see the P's on it here. And they've opened it up now to subscribers. So not only uh, can you get your P on the map if you're a municipality, but if you're a private party and you want to advertise parking available, um, you can subscribe as a service and they will actually add that on there. Um, so there are some, some opportunities to do something along the lines of, of what you're talking about here. I, I like all, all those, Any, anything that can help us get people to understand. One of the things that when we talked about with the barriers, was there are a lot of people that said, I work at this facility and I have no parking. And at the same time, I was looking at the GIS and seeing parking lots behind some of these businesses that were complaining they had no parking. They had parking for their customers, they had parking for their, maybe not enough, but they did have some. Um, but nobody knew it was there. So if I were a business and no one knows that I've got a small parking lot behind my business off of Main Street, especially when we're looking at the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm directionally challenged, I'll say the side towards the post office. <laughs> There's a lot of little parking lots behind those buildings. When you talked about doing that parking garage, you talked about having an easement. A lot of people don't even know that those parking lots are back there. Um, I personally didn't know until I met someone who actually has a business there and said, oh, you can park your car there. Uh, we open it up after five o'clock at night. Had no idea. So I, I think it's important for us to find some either technology or way of getting people there, in including these businesses. You know, we know that they could get, um, Deliveries back there. The delivery cars want to come that way. The one of the things that we talked about was that the um, angle parking. Nashville used to have it many years ago when we didn't have the islands, and and so on. That was wonderful. We also talked about Concord, how Concord did it, and they created the middle row for for delivery. Yep. It wasn't just for a left lane or something. So I think those are some of the ideas that when we do finally talk about redesigning Main Street that that would be something, but I, it's, parking is my biggest bugaboo, especially in the downtown area, because I know there's so much parking there and people just can't find it. So whether it be an app, whether it be signage, we really have to communicate that out to the public um, as best we can, so thanks. All right, folks, last section. Uh, pricing strategies. Um, and this is very high level. Uh, I'm not prepared at this point to talk about any recommendations for changing pricing, simply because we're not even sure what we're recommending yet. We would need to price that out first before we really opined on this. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the role that pricing can play. Um, increasingly, you're seeing uh, pricing, especially pricing of parking, as an overall mobility strategy. 
Um, certainly Nashua is not at the place yet where they need to think about pricing to incentivize the use of other alternative modes. Uh, but as Alderman O'Brien pointed out, you're growing up fast and it may be something that is on the horizon at this point. Uh, the good news is uh, if and when you're ready to do that, um, there is, that, that ground has been covered uh, a number of different places. Um, San Francisco and Seattle were two of the earlier adopters of the idea of using pricing to um, change as, as a strategy here. Boston has done a limited pilot on using pricing uh, as a strategy as well. And really what pricing is, is it is an opportunity to influence behavior. And one of the best analogies I can point to as a former smoker is cigarettes. Um, from uh, an early age, uh, the education programs that were available to every student in America, we all knew they were bad for you. And yet, uh, it did nothing to change consumption. Consumption nationally didn't start to really go down until the cost started to go up substantially uh, because um, pricing really influences or impacts behavioral change. Now, this is an accessible um, but um, stark example of that. Uh, uh, one that is probably a little closer here. Uh, cigarettes, uh, like ice cream bars on the left-hand side, are high elasticity good. So small changes in pricing can make, uh, lead to huge changes in demand. Um, parking's a little bit more like gas which is very low as elasticity. As we all know right now, the price of gas goes up and we all don't stop driving, uh, even if we would wish we could. So um, when we talk about price changes, we're talking about small changes to meet small goals, not huge changes to affect huge uh, impacts here. Um, in terms of change, this is a good time to talk about it. Uh, when you look at where Nashua is priced relative to other communities in northern Massachusetts and around New Hampshire, uh, we're at the lower end of the scale in almost every category, uh, from monthly parking to um, hourly parking both on and off the street to the basic fine structure. Um, it is, we, we lead the market, if you will, or at least this group of comparables in only one place, and that's fines for violation of snow bans. Um, we're right up the top there. Uh, but everything else, we're at the lower end of the scale. My understanding is there hasn't been a price adjustment since 2011. Uh, so inflation has been driving up costs to provide parking at 3% a year for the last 10 plus years. Um, at some point, you need to recover that money somehow, and um, Nashville may be due for an adjustment in order to just offset the cost of inflation and bring them a little bit more in line with some of the communities that they're competing with um, for uh, residents, customers, uh, and businesses. Um, Changing the price of parking is always a volatile question. I looked around to see if there was any place that did it particularly well in my opinion. The one that I came back with and I talked about a little bit earlier is Missoula, Montana, which while it is 2,500 miles to the west, uh, has a lot in common in terms of size, population, housing density, population density, uh, geography and general makeup with um, the city of Nashua. The folks who run the parking system out there are the Missoula Parking Commission instead of a parking department, but they're basically a department within um, the community here. And uh, as of 2020, they came up with a very interesting uh, policy that's on the books now, which is they have to execute an annual study of parking conditions across the system. They look at utilization on a facility by facility and lot by lot basis. They look at development that's coming into the area. They look at what their costs were to provide parking that year. 
Uh, they look at several other metrics, and then they come together and they put together an analysis with a series of initial recommendations. That analysis goes out to every stakeholder that's impacted by the Missoula Parking Commission ahead of time. And a public hearing is uh, scheduled for that commission to invite the public once informed to come in and have their say before they vote anything into action. So it's a very transparent policy process. It's uh, an arduous process and a very time consuming process, but it's a great way to be very transparent and very engaged with the community that's impacted and to educate them on why you might need to make those rate adjustments rather than trying to do it um, in a vacuum where uh, there are a lot of inferences that can arise. So if you were looking for a model on introducing rate adjustments uh, in the future, that's not a bad one. So those, uh, that's parking pricing, and that is my full presentation. Uh, we had saved some time at the end for uh, feedback and comment, and certainly we're, we're still here to hear that. However, I think we got a lot of that as we went along as well. So I, I want to yield the floor to you. And hearing no questions, I thank you all. Uh, I know it's been a slog. I appreciate you burying with me and going through me with this on this. Uh, this, um, this meeting, the recording of this meeting and this presentation will be posted online in the next couple days along with a link to the survey tool uh, that we put online as well. So if you wanna go through and review this again, uh, ask questions, make comments on these things. Uh, we have a, a vehicle to do that. Uh, there are a number of deliverables that are coming out of this process that are also going to be posted online over the next uh, few weeks and months so that folks can see the more detailed analysis uh, and, and recommendations that have come out of this process here. Um, but I thank you so much for your time and your input. Thank you, everyone. Thank Appreciate you, Randy. it. Thank you, Jill. Thank you.